All right, Dr. Mabizela, I think the first question, I think this is the question that came up most on social media because we did pose the question, um, we'll ask students to kind of ask questions, mm. um, is that in the midst of a sexual violence protest, um, we saw this morning that, that you as a man laid hands on a woman um, without her consent. Yeah. Um, what would you have to say in response to that? Um, I, I have apologized undeservedly about, uh, about that incident. Um, uh, there was lots of frustration um, and so I, I saw the video and um, I again apologize without reservation. Without reservation? Yeah, I, the, yeah. the intention was to remove the barricade, it was not to yeah. uh, to tackle um, uh, the person and I, again I, I, I do apologize. I think, I think that leads me quite neatly to the second question though, is is that frustration, that feeling of, of um, being frustrated and the fact that you're wanting to take down the barricades? Um, because I think the important question, the core question is why is roads management not standing in solidarity with students at the moment? And I think that links into the fact that mm. there are students and staff who are having to continue with the academic project because a shutdown isn't happening um, and are having to continue their daily lives despite protest action and are being painfully triggered mm -hmm. consistently through their day and are having to either deal with the fact that they might lose their DP or that they then have to either face their aggressors um, or, you know, the protests happening. Right. Um, so, so basically the question is, why no shutdown? We are in full solidarity with the students. Um, I have always been very firm that any uh, campaign aimed at raising awareness on issues of sexual violence um, and rape is something which is very important. And this institution has over the past 11 years run this silent protest, which is the biggest uh, awareness raising campaign yeah. on issues of gender-based violence. And I think that is something which is important. And of course, one can review how successful that has been. Yeah. And I think that is important. So we are in full solidarity. In fact, when... Let me, let me, uh, stop, let me stop you there. In, in the sense that you said that you're in full solidarity, yet there's this protest happening, and yet you're, you yourself are taking down the barricades. That is a, that is a symbol of the protest. Yeah. Um, so surely those things then don't line up. No. Look, we, we had a, a very long discussion today um, yeah. about the issue of shutdown and what it would achieve. And I think that this is important. Uh, a shutdown of or curtailing of an, or suspension of the academic activities of an institution is not a trivial matter. It is an important matter which impacts on the entire university. Yeah. Uh, so in our discussions, we agreed that the issues of sexual violence and rape, which have been raised, and. I'm delighted that we are where we are now, must be incorporated in the curriculum of our university. So, in fact, starting soon, uh, we will ask all our academics to include in their lectures an opportunity for robust debate and discussions on the issues of sexual violence and rape and gender-based violence yeah. more broadly. I think, uh, I think in terms of that, though, I think, I think the, the key question is, in terms of the students that are still being triggered because the shutdown isn't being isn't being allowed, and and I think it's not even just students; it's staff as well, yeah. because there've even been roads confessions about staff members saying, you know, this is a very triggering environment for me. I know I've seen just sitting in, in your in your foyer, I've seen multiple staff members yeah. emotional, and I know that you are probably feeling quite emotional about all of this as well. Yeah. So, in terms of the dynamic between, so peace was fall essentially the, the the day of, I think it was a shutdown was announced. Um, yet, for an issue that is really people's lives and people's well-beings, um, we're not having a shutdown. Okay. Um, so I think that's that's where people sure. are really curious as to, okay, cool, education is important, but if we don't have, if we're not comfortable in the space in which we're getting education, and if we're not, yeah. uh, if we're having to face, you know, people who have committed sexual violence against us, okay. um, you know, how are we to actually get it, get this education? So the fact that there isn't a shutdown makes people feel. That the, you know that the university isn't in support. The university is in full support, uh, but you see, again, in our discussions, it became very clear that a shutdown. What it will do is that people will stay at home uh, and they will not engage. And and so, 
if there is no meaningful engagement and you're simply staying away for a day, it will not advance the greater purpose of educating the broader university community on issues of sexual violence and, and rape. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to disagree with you there though, um, just in terms of the fact in the Feast Must Fall protest, we did have a shutdown, right. we did have engagement. Okay. And things were sorted out. Can I explain how that happened? Yeah, please, please that, just, because right. I think that's something no. that we need clarity on as, as to why people staying at home. Right. Because clearly, I think currently now there's about 400 people right. kind of protesting. Right. Um, the the, the Fears Must Fall campaign, yeah. we knew in advance that a certain day had been designated as a national shutdown. And so we made appropriate arrangements for that. And, and that is important. What we are saying here is that institutionally, we need to engage the issues of sexual violence and rape. And the best way to do that is not to shut down the university, but is to open the lecture halls and the lecture theaters and encourage academics and students uh, not just to continue with business as usual. So the lectures should not be just the ordinary lectures that you give every day, but make sure that uh, from now on, we build in our lectures issues pertaining to sexual violence and rape. Uh, and that we believe, perhaps it is the most productive use of the time that we have. Uh, I, I really hope that we will not simply return to the usual way we have always given lectures. And we agree that we must identify uh, people with the necessary skills to navigate this very difficult uh, yeah. space because you know, think, some people don't have I those. Zilla, I, like, I hear you, and I do, that, I, that sure, academic project is important, but I think, again, you're not answering the question about why, in terms of students being triggered um, and having to relive and having to see people on, say, the list right. around campus, Right. Um, why we're not shutting down for their sake. Because okay. there are a large number of people who, and we've seen this through silent protests, which you yourself brought up, why we're not for their sake, even if it's for a day, even if it's for two days, having a shutdown. Because I know you said that we knew that there was a national shutdown and we knew that there was a deadline, but the university shut down days before then. Yeah. Um, shut down on the Monday, not the Wednesday. Um, so my concern is that, ba basically let me put it to you this way, I've had people tell me that Rhodes specifically, financially, is not in the state to support another shutdown. So that if another shutdown happens, within a few months, Rhodes itself will shut down. I've heard this um, from a member of the SRC. Is that perhaps the reason why you're kind of pushing for, for no shutdown? Um, or, is it, or is it purely just that reason? Because if, if, no. if it is a financial thing, then fair. No, um, no, it, it is not a financial thing. Um, it, it's not a financial thing. We, we cannot equate finances to the emotions that people are feeling. And so it's not a financial thing. It is the question, in fact, we had long discussions with the deans. Yeah. Uh, it's about how we productively use the time in order to disseminate uh, the, inf the uh, knowledge of issues of sexual violence and rape. Okay. And, and let, let, let me just get there so that I can, I, I think, just, just so we can get you to the next okay. questions, because I think, I think we've kind of gone in circles here, but, um, so I think, in, I know you've said a lot about um, the kind of stuff that you're wanting to then do, so task force, um, review of policy, that kind of stuff. Um, but what is Rhodes then planning on doing, A, um, regarding the list of alleged perpetrators right. um, and those currently being prosecuted? So for example, I know for, for, for a fact that the people that just came through and saw you yeah. um, are currently in the process of prosecuting someone for, for, for a rape, right. um, and B, in changing the system so that one rape is reported tactfully and, sure. and is dealt with properly yeah. because that has been the one complaint and we've seen that through the chapter 2 one sure. thing sure. Um, and then also secondly that it's eliminated from campus as a whole sure right uh, in terms of the list uh, we have agreed that those people whose names are on the list and there are survivors mm. that the survivors should come in fact there will be an oh there is an open call to the survivors to provide us with the statements. Uh, in fact, we are in the process of dealing with one of those because mm -hmm. I have received consent from the survivor to access her documents uh, at, the, at the counseling center. In terms of the procedures, I have to run a suspension hearing. Okay. But this is something which does not take forever. 
I, I, I will invite the person to say a charge of rape has been uh, made against, laid against you and I have a statement before me. Uh, you can make a representation on why you should not. I think uh, on, be on, on that, so I think the one one big issue, with, the two big issues with that, is one, some people are afraid to come forward, and the fact that the onus is on them yeah. to then come forward is a difficult one. And because, in terms of proving yeah. um, a rape or a sexu uh, an, an account of sexual violence, especially in a lot of these cases, yeah. are long term yeah. um, kind of cases. So, how do we then expect? those people to then come forward and how do we deal with those alleged perpetrators if survivors won't come through. Yeah. Um, but then I think also secondly is that I, it, it feels difficult to hear that knowing that there are people who have, and this has come through the Chapter 2 on 2 mm -hmm. campaign, um, people who have gone to the Rhodes prosecutors, mm -hmm. who have gone to the proctors and, and said, hi there, this has happened to me, I have made, here is my claim, mm -hmm. and they've been told things like, are you sure you want to do this? You're going to ruin his reputation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's this feeling of, yeah. and, I think, and I think this is, again, part of the reason why this is so big and why there are so many people involved, yeah. um, is that people feel that they can't reach out to Rhodes yeah. for assistance, but that shouldn't be the case. Right. So that's essentially what I'm asking is what, sure. what is, what is happening in terms of okay. changing it so that it's no longer that case. There are a number of things that we have agreed on. And again, as I indicated, we had a very productive meeting with the students today. One, our, our policy on sexual violence urgently needs to be reviewed. I have put together a team to look at that. Because you see, our policy is, uh, is premised on the National Act, on the Sexual uh, Assault Act, uh, which requires that um, the, uh, the, the person who is making an allegation proves that the they person would. had an intent mm. uh, to, uh, to commit rape. And that is something which I must confess is bizarre. Yeah. So we are reviewing our policy so that it becomes simpler and easy to implement and remains consistent with the laws of the land. So that is important. I think, Secondly, I think one thing, just, just to then jump in there though, I think policy, although it is an issue, yeah. um, basing it on a national document suggests that they are perhaps, you know, that, that it's, it's following the law to a yeah. degree. Yeah. I think one of the big issues, and I think this is what I'd, I'd like you to, to address specifically with, with, with regards to this question, is re regarding the proctors and the prosecutors. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are the people that people have said haven't dealt with this yes. properly. So policy is sure. good and well, sure. but if the people who they're reporting to right. aren't being sensitive and right. aren't right. able to engage, right. what happens there? Right. <laughs> Previously, you asked quite a number of questions that Indeed. I haven't had an opportunity to respond to okay. all of them. Uh, you asked issues re relating to reporting. Yeah. Uh, that is a problem. Yeah. I read the statements that were posted uh, out there, and I myself was shocked. Uh, so what, we are, what the task team is going to do is to review all our processes and procedures to make sure that uh, reporting is made relatively easier and that there is support, that there is empathy, that there are people with the right skills to handle issues of sexual violence and rape. Uh, it's not everyone who can do that. So we need to put in place uh, educational programs and training, not just for the staff who receive the reports, but for the entire university community. So we all become adequately sensitized on how we deal with issues of sexual violence and rape in, the, in this country, okay. uh, sorry, in this institution. Yeah. Because we do need to create a safe and secure environment. So reporting is the first crucial step in pinning down the, um, yeah. in making sure that we prosecute the perpetrators. But now, if we do not make sure that that reporting happens and that the people feel comfortable to report, then the investigation and the prosecution will not happen because uh, people will not report. So for me, it is absolutely crucial that we adequately resource the office that receives these reports yeah. and that it is a space which is comfortable and welcoming, uh, empathetic and supportive for those who wish to 
I think that leads me on to, very nicely to my next question. What about those who are too afraid or are unable to report? What do we then do in those cases? Because they, they, I, I received an email today from someone who said that they aren't able and they're, or that they're too afraid, basically, um, to come forward. Mm. How do we then, as roads, deal with that? Look, I, I think there is an important element of education here and the importance that we, we attach to reporting these things so that we can report, so that we can investigate them. I think people have to understand that this is something perhaps bigger than them. Because if someone where to rape one person, that person might rape another person. Yeah. So your reporting may prevent another rape. And so that is pretty critical. And I should pause you there for one second. Yeah, can we just like, are you about to wrap up? Um, I've got two more. Okay, two more. Um, okay, just a little bit. Cool. Yeah, just for sound. <laughs> sure. It's not bad having them back on it. Yeah. Just if you'll just repeat, just like in one or two sentences, summate your, your response to that, just that we've got that, because I think it may have been right. No, no what, I, what I'm saying here is that reporting is absolutely crucial. We should make sure that we have educational programs so that people understand that reporting is not just about themselves, reporting their unfortunate experience, but by reporting, they are probably preventing another possible case of rape. Um, and I think that for me is important. And so uh, people must feel comfortable, we must, it's not gonna come easy because of the stigma yeah. attached to, to all of these things, but we must de destigmatize it. We must work together and we must create a more caring community so that people feel confident yeah. to report these things. And you see, if they report them sooner, then we are able to gather the evidence that will make it possible for us to mount a successful prosecution of the, of the culprit and we are able to get rid of that person from our midst. Moving on then, um, one of the alleged um, reportedly, on, on the list of 11 names, um, reportedly has received hours um, for rape while at Rhodes. How in, and in what way is that in any form of a legitimate punishment? Look, if someone has received hours, I, again, I, I do not know because I don't run the disciplinary processes. We have to look comprehensively on all of these things. Uh, how we prosecute them and who prosecutes these things because issues have, or questions have been raised about uh, our prosecutors. And I did indicate yesterday when I addressed the students that in cases of rape, we are able to, in, to get external uh, prosecutors to successfully prosecute these cases. What for me is important is to create a situation where people feel comfortable to report their cases in the full knowledge that matters will be investigated thoroughly and that will be able to uh, prosecute successfully any person who commits such a and I, I think aside. that leads me to then my second last question because I actually have a follow up to something you've said earlier. In terms of the task team, in terms of that, what is the deadline for that? When can we expect results? Because I think the one other big thing that's happening now is people are wanting results now. Yeah. And obviously due process needs to happen. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we can't have people who are guilty of these kind of crimes walking around on our campus. So what is the deadline generally? Well, the, the first critical thing is to get rid of anyone who is... Uh, guilty of uh, this kind of crime on campus. Uh, so, or someone who uh, has been uh, accused of that. And if I have information, I have promised that I will work expeditiously and make sure that that person is suspended from the university while the investigation runs its course because uh, it just cannot be comfortable for a person to be in the same space as someone who violated uh, okay. that person. So to just summarize that in a sentence, you're saying that if, if someone is accused of rape um, and a statement is made in terms of all of that, the accused will then be suspended? What I will do once I receive the report, I will follow the process of uh, a pre-suspension hearing. Okay. Once that process has been concluded, uh, the person will have to be suspended. Uh, if any of my students 
uh, has been violated by any of those people on that list. But not only those, by any other person. person yeah. They can report, go to the uh, harassment office, report the case, and when they report and they want that disciplinary action be taken against that person, they should indicate that. And once a, a statement has been written, that comes to me, uh, then I'm able to run a pre-suspension pre hearing and that person is out of campus. Okay, perfect. And then in terms of, in terms of the other things, in terms of policy changes, in terms of that kind of stuff? Right. Let, let me just come back to the task team. Yeah. Again, fo follow the meeting today indicated that uh, uh, the, the task team will meet at five today okay. and they will start to draft the terms of reference. I've asked Professor uh, McLeod uh, of psychology yeah. to chair that, uh, that uh, task team, someone who is very knowledgeable on issues of sexual violence. Um, so the task team will meet this afternoon. They will put together a draft terms of reference. And once they've done that, uh, we will present them to the university. And that task team must get on with its work without delay. Absolutely. And we will have very tight time frames because these things can't wait for forever. There is another task team that is working alongside. Uh, by the way, both of these task teams have staff and students. Mm. Uh, the, the second task team is looking at the policy uh, to see how we can simplify it, how we can make it a lot more user friendly. Uh, because, by the way, in our disciplinary processes, the, the, the test is that of balance of probabilities. Uh, it's not uh, the one that you, you need in a court of law, uh, which is beyond, a, beyond reasonable doubt. And so, uh, in our discussions today, it became very clear to me that we can uh, improve our, our policy so that this requirement of the intention to commit rape uh, does not become a headlong. Uh, and I, I think uh, the people who were there were very, very positive. And so uh, these task teams have to report within a very short space of time because these issues are very urgent and we yeah. need to move forward with a sense of purpose and speed. Okay, and then my, fi my final question, and then I'll give you just a moment if, you, if there's anything else you'd like to contribute um, in terms of this and kind of say to Rhodes. But I think my last question is, knowing what you know about Rhodes' rape culture and about you know the, the environment that we're currently in, would you still recommend Rhodes to parents of students who are having to then come through to Rhodes? I would certainly recommend Rhodes to any parent. You see, one thing that um, we do not do is to hide things under the carpet. Uh, uh, there are challenges, but we are dealing with those challenges. I, I just want to actually bring you back up to the hi hiding that um, hiding things under the carpet because actually one of the other questions that I was going to ask but didn't think we'd have time for was about um, the rape statistics at Rhodes. The um, rape and statistics. That, yeah, and about how they haven't been released and that the argument for that was that it was to keep people's privacy. No. No, statistics do not provide uh, personal information. Um, I mean, just re releasing statistics sh shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. We, we can indicate that we, uh, so many cases of rape were reported, and so many were prosecuted, so many were successful, and so, I mean, that's, that information should be made available. Okay. So I, I really have no issues about okay. that. Uh, it, it's something that should be readily available to any person who wants to get an understanding of how successful or not successful we are uh, with these issues. Yeah. Okay. And then I don't know, just moving on, then if you have anything else that you'd like to contribute, just or say to the Rhodes students, you can even look directly into the camera. Um. Look, I, I think uh, what uh, Chapter 212 has done is to, is to bring to the fore something which um, has always been there, but perhaps has not been given sufficient attention. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy that we, we are moving in the right direction. We need to make our university safe and secure uh, for our students and for our staff. And we do need to make sure that uh, where our students report uh, instances of sexual violence and rape are welcoming, they are supportive, 
uh, and that people feel confident that when they report, something will be done and will be done expeditiously. And that is the promise I give you, that I will do my best uh, to expedite these processes and make sure that uh, any person who is uh, accused of rape uh, is dealt with and dealt with decisively. And in that way, we're able to create a relatively safer campus uh, for, for all. I think then just one final question, mm -hmm. just before I then let you continue to do your thing. Um, is then, so for example, if someone um, were to fall victim um, to sexual violence today, what would their procedure be right now? Who would they go speak to? As the system stand, that person would have to go to the harassment office. Of, by the way, they can report at the harassment office, they can report to their wardens. Uh, and I think there are other avenues for reporting. Speedy reporting is very important. And I really hope that people, I, I know it is difficult, uh, it's easier said than done. I've, I've had, I, I, I have friends who have been through this and uh, I've had engagements with them. It's easier said than done. Uh, if I could, I would persuade people to report in the shortest possible time so that we are able to secure the evidence and we are able to present the evidence for successful prosecution. Um, so at the moment they can report at the harassment office and once that report comes through, um, I get the statement, I will suspend any person who is charged of rape and there is a statement uh, to that effect mm -hmm. and I'm able to run a suspension hearing. Well, some people in our discussions were asking, why go through such an elaborate process? Why do you have a suspension hearing? A suspension hearing is important in the following sense. If I were to summarily suspend a person from the university, that person can go to court and say that, look, I've been suspended. I don't know why uh, it, an allegation has been made and on, based on the allegation, I have been suspended. And then the court will say, what was the basis of your suspension of the person? Uh, and so that the university will be in a predicament and then the court will simply throw that out of court. So what we want to do is to be sure that I receive a statement by uh, the survivor, I apply my mind to it, and then I engage the um, alleged perpetrator and say, look, there is a charge of rape against you, and this is uh, what is being done, there's an investigation, uh, we are suspending you. Okay. And, and that, I think, uh, will make things a, you know, a lot more manageable, rather than run the risk of going to court only to be told that uh, uh, yeah. that suspension is lifted. I think then just, again, I know I've said one last question, but one actual last question, looking forward, in terms of the barricades, in terms of shutdown attempts, in term of, terms of disruption, what is your stance on that? Because I know people have said that there was a move for um, a court thing, what is the word, court injunction against um, the protesters. Yeah. Um, can you confirm or deny that? I know um, Catherine said that it wasn't a thing, but if, if, is that something that Rhodes is considering? Um, and I know that you've also said that you really support the rights of Rhodes students to, to protest, and yet, again, we see you actively taking down barricades. So just a bit more clarity on that, okay. just going forward, just so that people know what your stance is in terms of what's happening out there. Right. I do support the right of all our students to protest peacefully and within the prescripts of the law. And that right is protected in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I have absolutely no problems with that. Uh, the difficulty arises when in the exercise of one's right, one then interferes with the rights of another person. So um, no one has a right to undermine another person's right. So the right to peaceful protest within the prescripts of the law is fully covered in our constitution. Insofar as the court interdict is concerned, no, we do not have any court interdict. 
it, it will be a very regrettable thing for me to have to resort to a court interdict. Uh, such things become necessary if there is um, an infringement on the rights of others or if there is danger to, to property or, or life. Uh, but for as long as people protest peacefully uh, within the bounds of the law. Uh, so essentially then, just to then to make that to kind of engage with what you said, is you, that you said that you feel that in terms of the barricades and in terms of a lot of the class disruption that you feel that that's infringing on people's rights and as such you also said that a court interdict is only applicable when rights are being infringed upon. So is that you then suggesting that if it continues that a court interdict is the route to go? Because I know, I know a big concern is the fact that the police presence yeah. this time around has been a lot stronger than it ever was during Fees Must Fall. Mm. Um, and to my knowledge and from the reports that I've received, um, and obviously as editor of Activate, I receive a lot of reports as to what's happening. Mm. This has been infinitely more peaceful um, mm. than what it was last year. Mm. So where do we then stand on that? Well, look, uh, in terms of the barricades, and uh, that does infringe on the rights of others, the freedom of movement on campus, of the workers and of the students, of other students. And so my, uh, my hope is that uh, that would not uh, become a, a pattern, because it does infringe upon the rights of others. Uh, we, are, we are also a residential campus, and so our students who are in residences, their movement becomes curtailed uh, when, when there are barricades. Um, insofar as the police are concerned, uh, they are not on campus and they do not come to campus. They patrol at the outside uh, and um, they, I, I don't command them there. I don't really have any, I don't give them any instructions. In, ter in terms of that though, um, I know that you say that you know, it restricts freedom of movement I hear that to a degree, um, but the barricades very much haven't been a kind of thing that have said, students, you aren't allowed to leave campus. Since you can't drive out of campus, like the barricade exists. Yeah. Um, and that was very much during the Feasmus Fall movement, and I think it, it will probably be similar now. Um, but I think the main difference, and I think this is what you're alluding to in terms of the residence thing, is that this isn't a full shutdown that students are wanting. It's an academic shutdown. So re residences will still be working, dining halls will still be allowed, you know, delivery trucks in and out, healthcare centre, counselling centre, and all of that will still be functioning. Um, so I wonder, and I kind of, it, it begs the question, why then are you still opposed? And I know that you've said that you feel that you know being in the space and you know having people in lectures and that kind of stuff is the way to do it. But I also know that you're then ask, asking people who have no expertise in sexual violence to then give lectures on such. Um, I know, for example, that in years gone by, I personally put in a complaint about sure. the, the sexual, um, the gender dynamics talk mm -hmm. during orientation week, mm -hmm. um, the training for sub wardens and senior students, because it was highly problematic. Mm -hmm. And that's someone who is inherently supposed to be good at, good at that. Yeah. So in terms of that, surely a shutdown and really making a statement and really going, look, we all need to talk about this, mm -hmm. all of us, because if we don't, the university will not be open, you will not be able to go to class. Does more to educate and does, get, does more to get people to engage than just saying, well, it's business as usual, but we'll also tell you some things. No, it's not, a, it's not business as usual. You're absolutely right. It takes special expertise to actually facilitate discussions on sexual violence and rape. That is absolutely true. And so in our discussions, we said, look, we have to do this in a way that is supportive. You can't expect someone who uh, does not know how to facilitate those discussions to do that because there are emotions. People will become emotional. Yeah. So you need to have the necessary support. You need to have counselors and people who will be able to manage all the raw pain yeah. that will come. But, but I think it's not that, but actually taking what you've just said there, that is the motivation for a shutdown insofar as 
the students themselves who are feeling all that emotion and all that pain, and staff members too, have said, we want a shutdown so that people take this seriously. So I don't know then where we then balance that, because that's, that's essentially what is happening on campus present, presently, and people are, f are for the campaign. Um, they're for an academic shutdown. Um, obviously, there's students who say, you know, look, I'm for you, let me do my work when I want to do my work, but I'll, it's fine, I'll boycott lectures. Obviously, there's, there's a multiplicity of views, but there's a large portion of this university that is feeling very, very strongly that a shutdown is, is what is needed and that they're not being supported by Rhodes mm -hmm. in not having a shutdown. Mm -hmm. And that you symbolically taking down the barricades this morning is a sign that Rhodes doesn't support them. Yeah. So I think what really summates all of this is that, yes, cool, we're going to change the, the policies. And yes, if people you know, lay claims um, against people, that those will be dealt with. But what they currently don't feel is that Rhodes is a place that is supportive by the sheer fact that Rhodes is actively trying to stop them. I don't think that we're we are actively trying to stop them. I don't know if you can if you can say that after having to try to take down the barricades, though. I think we have traversed this. Uh, I, 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 I know I know we've I talked have, about it in a previous question, but I do think that it, it bears repeating because I think it, just, it links. It was kind of everything else that's again, said. as I've indicated, it was discussed extensively with the deans and and after a long discussion and looking at the pros and cons and guided uppermost by what would benefit the institution more. Simply shutting down the campus and people who live off campus will stay in their digs and those in the residences will stay in their residences and then what? Uh, so the view, the preponderant view was that uh, we must continue with the lectures but we should not continue with business as usual. We must create uh, opportunities and spaces for facilitated, robust engagements on issues of sexual violence and rape. Uh, that was the preponderance. I have, I have two thoughts on that then, and I know that I'm dragging this out, but I, I do think it's important, and I think this is, the, these, this is the main issue that students have, is that one, that you've said that we've had a conversation, and you've then listed that you've had a conversation with the deans. Were students involved in that conversation? The initial part of the discussions was with the students, and uh, so... And their response was? Well, of course, they, uh, they expressed their wish that uh, a shutdown be effected. Uh, that was so, so, again, then, on that, that's the students specifically saying to you, we want a shutdown, we think this is what is best for us, it's an emotional time, yeah. and yet Rhodes as an institution has then gone, no. Um, but the, but uh, we have to look more broadly uh, and, and we have to decide what is in the best interest of the university. Uh, yes, we, the views of the students are taken into consideration and the views of the broader Rhodes University community mm -hmm. also have to be taken into consideration. By the way, what are, what are those the, concerns the, though the then? Thing is the, because because the, for me, the, the thought is, is that the concern should be on making a safe environment for those who have been victims um, or survivors I, I, rather. I would say for everyone. And, and for everyone, it's, and, it's and, and for essentially everyone. for everyone. Because the whole thing is, is the numbers that we're seeing out here are not reflective of the number of people who've suffered. Yeah. And yet, in the same breath, you're saying what is best for the institution, but the institution is the students. And I know that there's research that happens and that there are multi multiple facets, but Rhodes Without Its Students isn't a university. Sure. And so it feels difficult for me to understand how there can then be a justification as to, well, we think that we've done what's best, when the students themselves, by your own admission, have said what we feel we need is a shutdown. Students have had outcries, and this is the one thing that, that, that you haven't touched on that I did ask about earlier. Those students and staff members that are being triggered mm. by the protests and, you know, by all of this, mm. is this really in their best interest? Continuing business as usual and having, I know I'm saying business as usual, but I mean, we really can't call it much else besides that. I know perhaps a couple of lectures that, you know, helps educate is a thing. But at the same time, we have staff and students throughout the year being given lectures and having to go to things like, um, you know, the production at the beginning of the, the drama department, education about rape culture. So how much of a difference is that going to make, A, um, and B, 
if so many people are calling out saying we need a shutdown, we need a shutdown, why is then roads? And I and I know that you've said that it's 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 considered, and I know that and I know that that's a thing, um, but I think students themselves don't feel that they have been considered, and I think that's that's part of what we're trying to get clarity on here is that. I think students would be able to understand, and that's why that's why I posed the question about you know if they have financial issues. Mm. I think students would understand. Cool, then let's not have a shutdown. But there doesn't seem to be any logical reason that students can see, and that in the conversation that we've had that I can really see, that is in the best interest of the students, because the students themselves have spoken and said that they feel that they need a shutdown. And, it, and it, the whole thing is, it can be the thing, and this is something that you yourself could organize, is that we don't need to barricade. Barricade is only something that's taken as, as a last resort because it's to stop people kind of going to lectures and stuff. If you were to go, academics are closed today, lectures wouldn't happen. And think it, things would be okay. And people would be able to get together and meet and have conversations and do, do all those things as they did through Peace Miss Hall. The barricades are only a, a, a means to an end. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just, and I, know, I think this is the general issue, students are grappling with why Rhodes doesn't seem to be that supportive. Um, because I think that's what it comes down to, is that they've been voicing all these issues and yet it feels like it's falling on deaf ears. And I'm not saying that that's the case, because I, and, I, and from your, your accounts and from your responses, it's clear that you are trying to engage with this, and I know it's, it's a difficult thing for one man to have to engage with. But at the same time, the question is there. You know, the students have said. I don't know if you have any thing to then say to that. Look, I think as an educational institution, we have to take every opportunity as, a, as an opportunity, every event and everything that happens as an opportunity to advance the educative processes of the university and also to advance transformation more broadly. Uh, and so, again, we spent a lot of time on this, and I, 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 I'm afraid I'm just repeating myself. Yeah. We looked at this issue from many, many different angles, and the preponderant view was that the greater purpose would be served uh, in the manner that I have described. and. Um, we do need to put in place uh, systems and mechanisms to support our students. Uh, and I, that, that is out of question for me. Uh, our counseling center has to be appropriately equipped mm. so that when people feel the emotions, they're able to be attended to. That, that is absolutely important. 